few injuries are as physically and emotionally distressing as a person um, with a permanent spinal cord injury or SCI. And the leading causes of spinal cord injury or SCI since 2015 is trauma since sustained in motor vehicle crashes, falls, violence, sports and recreational activities, and medical surgical mishaps. The cord can also be damaged by degenerative conditions and tumors. So let's talk about this. So this is just a picture of your spinal column. And you do have this picture on page 423. I just thought it was interesting because it shows that you have 33 vertebrae. Seven are cervical, C1 through C7. 12 thoracic, T1 through T12. 5 lumbar, L1 through L5, sacral, S1 through S5, and coccygeal, which are fused together. That's like the old tailbone from when we were apes, I guess. Um, but this is interesting, and when you hear someone say, oh, I have thoracic injury or oh, lumbar, and lumbar is a very common place to have an injury uh, or have a fusion or back surgery you hear a lot of people um, having back surgery so uh, let's go on but i want you to be aware of the 33 vertebrae and where each one is and how many little uh, vertebrae are in each one okay so um the bony vertebrae consists of 33 vertebrae as i said the vertebral column and uh, it's Who's at greatest risk for back injuries and herniated discs? Well, aging, aging people. Aging, in aging, the discs lose water and they're less effective as shock absorbers. Intervertebral discs separate the vertebrae and each of which consists of a body and an arch. That's a little anatomy lesson. Uh, the central canal is contiguous with which ventricle of the brain do you think? Well, if you think about which ventricle of the brain makes the spinal fluid, that's around the fourth ventricle. So that's where the central canal is. Oh, oh no, I can't turn the page. Okay, so there's also discs. And the spinal cord passes through an opening in the center of each arch. And on page 423, it has some good pictures there. And you can see it goes through a vertebral foramen. The word foramen means an opening. So it, uh, the cord enters through an opening in the center of each arch. Uh, the gray matter, and there's gray matter, gray matter and white matter. Gray controls motor and sensory activities. And white matter conveys the messages between the brain and the spinal cord. Now the cerebral spinal fluid circulates through the brain and spinal column, bathing and protecting the entire central nervous system. The spinal cord can be reflexive, in other words, response initiated. So it's a reflex to something, right? and then uh, the sensory. So what are some common causes of closed spinal cord injuries? Trauma, stretching and twisting the spinal cord, compression and flexion. Some open injuries would be often the result of a trauma and that would cut, like cut across the cord. Uh, the extent of damage can be seen on table 24.3. So if you follow with me in your book, uh, the spinal cord extends from the medulla of the brain stem to the level of the second lumbar vertebrae. And C8, uh, they're able to manage a wheelchair and L4 to S5, they can ambulate with braces possible. Now, 
I believe that information is on page 428. Uh, we'll get to that too, but um, this is just a little bit of, about the types of injuries. So um, when we talk about the spinal cord, the spinal cord function may be classified as either reflexive or relay in nature. With reflexive activity, now this is really important for you guys to remember about reflexes. And you know how often reflexes are checked in neuro, right? So with reflexive activity, the sensory stimulus is received and a response is initiated at the level of the spinal cord where this occurs. The knee jerk is an example of reflexive activity. With relay activity, the stimulus enters the spinal cord and travels up the ascending tracks to relay sensory signals from the external environment to the brain. Information is processed in the brain and responses are initiated by impulses transmitted to the body by way of de descending tracks. So what are some effects of spinal cord injuries? Well, Respiratory impairment is a problem, especially if it's C1 through C4, because that's where the, the nerve that innervates or initiates the diaphragm contracting and expanding. So if you have an impairment in that area, uh, you might not be able to breathe on your own because the phrenic nerve, which initiates the diaphragm, is affected. Uh, spinal in sh a spinal shock is the level the injury ceases. It becomes flaccid. So spinal shock means flaccidity, flaccidity, <laughs> flaccidity. <laughs> Say that 10 times. But it will resolve. Now, autonomic dysreflexia, I'm going to talk about that. I have a whole slide just for that. But just to let you know, uh, it consists of hypertension, it's an autonomic reflex, but dis means it's not a good reflex. So it could be hypertension and it's triggered by stimuli. You can have spasticity, impaired sensory and motor function, impaired bladder function, and also impaired bowel function. With the impaired bladder function, um, during the period of spinal shock, all bladder and bowel function cease. An indwelling catheter is inserted to empty the bladder and permit close monitoring of urine output. As soon as the patient's fluid status is stabilized, the indwelling catheter is removed and the bladder drained by intermittent catheterization. So that may occur in spinal shock. Impaired bowel function. So the absence of bowel function in the first day or two after injury may require insertion of an nasogastric tube for decompression. Peristalsis usually turns by the third day post injury, but they still may have um, some bowel misfunction, malfunction. Impaired temperature regulation. Depending on the level of the injury, the patient may have difficulty maintaining body temperature within a normal range. If a person becomes too cold, the body responds with vasoconstriction and shivering. If a person becomes too hot, sweating helps to dissipate the heat. They might have impaired sexual function. So spinal levels S2, 3, and 4 controlled sexual function. So injury at or above these levels results in dysfunction. Impaired skin integrity. So because the uh, patient may be unable to move, uh, there is pressure, their, their weight is just dead weight um, because they can't move. So that pressure on bony prominences can be really a lot. So we have to be sure to position these patients very carefully. Get them up as soon as possible when they can. Disturbed body image. Uh, the effect of SCI on the patient's self-concept and body image is significant. Of course, it depends on their 
life, on their injury, what their usual activity level is. Um, but it can be, it can precipitate a crisis. I mean, if they're a normally active person, I remember I had a patient who was 16 and a basketball player. He was headed to basketball practice and he was hit head on by a woman who was texting. Well, he's now a tetraplegic, quadriplegic. He is in a wheelchair and he's, he's now 22 years old. But, you know, he just, he has no life. He can't do anything. And he was once very active. He enjoyed music, still does. So remember, even if they your patient cannot move, they can still hear. So you can talk to them. You can play music for them. And actually, that's very comforting and a good therapy. Uh, during spinal shock, and spinal shock is when like all this first happens. And the spine is just like shocked. And functions cease. And the bowel and bladder functions cease. Um, this is just a picture showing you some uh, types of injuries, some mechanisms of spinal cord injury. And I believe this is in your book. It just shows like in, when a car hits you, that whiplash, what it does to your neck and the trauma that it can cause. Or if you fall on your back, what can happen? So medical treatment in the acute phase of injury. So the first thing uppermost in our mind is to save the patient's life. And that's an airway. And we know that from our ABCs. We know that from Maslow's hierarchy of care. We have to establish an airway. But in order to do that, we have to avoid flexion of the neck because they may have a neck injury. So we would use the jaw thrust to get open that airway, the jaw thrust maneuver. Um, preventing further cord injury, we always want to be sure they're in alignment. We want to do a neuro assessment on our patient. And, and I'm kind of thinking when you come upon an accident and or you're in the ER and you're meeting that patient for the first time, so you have to really do a good assessment because you have to see what level they're at, what, what they can do and what they can't do. Um, preventing further cord injury. So I, I wanna address the, um, pa this page 430, and it's uh, figure 24.6. And this is the Gardner-Wells tongs. So this is important to, to look at and know and understand because what this is doing is it's providing alignment for the spine. And the way it's doing it is by putting these screws into the skull. And that's the tongue. So you can imagine now, think about this in the care of that patient. So not only are we aware of alignment, very aware, when a patient's in traction, we have to be very aware of alignment. But these are screws going into the head. So we have to be aware of infection. So always check the sites, um, temperature, patient's temperature, and any redness uh, that the patient may have or complaints of pain. Of course, they're gonna have pain, but we always don't just think, oh, well, they're in pain because they had trauma. No, let's be sure that it's not something else because we're always that detective looking for other problems. So the Gardner-Wells tongs, and you notice there's some weights at the end that's kind of pulling, and it's pulling all the vertebral bodies, kind of separating them so that the patient has no compression. And then there's the halo, which is figure 24.7, and that is similar um, but this one, the patient can move around. So the patient can walk around, can't turn their head because the screws are still in their head, but it's like in a halo effect and it rests on their shoulders. 
there's shoulder pads there. But same thing, it's got to be aware of infection in these patients and alignment. And then there's some special beds and cushions that can be used um, to prevent complications of immobility. Uh, the striker wedge frame, I think, is pretty interesting. Figure 24.8, you can see it keeps the legs uh, apart. Everything is padded. Um, and that bed can rotate. It can turn from side to side, which helps movement in the lungs, you know, so they don't develop any pneumonia. So that can rotate and turn. can even go upside down if it had to. Um, Drug therapy, so a really great drug therapy for spinal cord injury patients is methylprednisone. And why is that? Prednisone, cortisone, anti-inflammatory. So it reduces damage to cellular membrane. I want you to remember that, it's really important to remember. Reduces damage to cellular membrane because it reduces the inflammation in that area. So we want to preserve cord function in our patients. And the way we might need to do that is surgery. So a laminectomy may be in order, and that involves removing all or part of the posterior arch of the vertebra to alleviate compression on the cord or spinal nerves. Or we can have a fusion that needs to, um, the, the, <sighs> The spine needs to be fused together so there's no movement there. So here's just a picture of the Gardner Wells tongs to immobilize the cervical spine. The halo device also al aligning the cervical vertebrae. So now this gets a whole slide to itself. Autonomic dysreflexia. I mentioned it earlier and I'm mentioning it now. There's, it's on page 433. There's multiple questions on this, um, on this test as well as I'm sure on the NCLEX there will be. So autonomic dysreflexia, really important to know there's potential for injury related to autonomic dysreflexia. Patient care should be directed at prevention. And how do we do that? I'll tell you. Because it's a medical emergency if we don't. And if this starts to happen, it's an emergency. And it occurs in patients with injuries above level T6, thoracic level T6. So as spinal shock or injury subsides, and the reflex activity returns, risk of autonomic or the autonomic nervous system, reflexia increases. So there's triggers for this. It's a reflex that occurs. So distended bladder, an enema, a sudden position change, all those things can initiate a reflex and that reflex is a medical emergency their blood pressure goes up. There's three indicators, hypertension, seizures, and bradycardia. Now that's in box 24.1. So how do, we, how do we prevent that? Well, raise the head 45 degrees because sometimes position changes can cause it. So if you, you know, have them laying flat and then sit them up, that can be the position change. So raise their head at 45 degrees, leave it there if you can. Check their Foley catheter for occlusion and patency because that is one of the things that a distended bladder can cause this dysreflexia, which can be a big problem. So if the catheter is kinked or occluded, and causes distension of the bladder, it can cause autonomic reflexia. So check the Foley catheter. 
the patient may experience nasal congestion, facial flushing, pounding headache, and that severe hypertension. So these are really important. Um, if you want to read through that, be sure that you understand. It's on page 433, potential for injury related to autonomic dysreflexia. It also has a box, 24.1. I mentioned the triad of uh, hy sudden hypertension, bradycardia, and seizures. And that's important to remember. Question number one, the average, pay, the average cost for the first year for a patient with paraplegia is approximately what? What do you think? Let's just pick the highest one. So the answer is D. Average cost for the first year varies from $1 million for high tetraplegia paralysis of all four extremities to 518,000 for paraplegia, and that's paralysis of the lower extremities. One of the most serious and potentially dangerous problems for the spinal cord injured patient is, pick one. Yes, autonomic dysreflexia. I want you to really commit that to memory. Um, one of the most serious and potentially dangerous problems for the spinal cord injured patient is autonomic dysreflexia. It's an exaggerated response of the autonomic nervous system to some noxious or painful stimuli. Very important to remember. Now we're going to get to some more. So always, always, always monitor the patient's level of consciousness. And that's not just are they awake and alert, but their pupils move extremities. So the full focal assessment of neuro. Check their vital signs because their blood pressure might be in jeopardy or their heart rate. They might be bradycardic. Respiratory status. We always want to know has the spinal cord injury even extended? Because they're always at risk of more injury if someone hasn't taken care of them properly. So keep an eye on the respiratory status, not only the phrenic nerve um, and the expansion of the chest, but also listen to the lungs because we want to monitor for pneumonia because they're not movement, they're not moving. So uh, we want to be sure and that they're not getting any kind of pneumonia. Motor and sensory function, is it returning? Is it staying the same? Has it gotten worse? So check their motor and sens sensory function. That could be reflexes. Remember we talked about Babinski reflex on their foot. Um, I and O, we wanna be sure what goes in comes out. So good assessment skills, always. So what are some interventions? So inadequate oxygenation. We always want to be careful of that. Keep an eye on their oxygenation. Potential for injury. Risk for injury related to autonomic dysreflexia. And why are they at a potential for injury again? Do you remember? Well, because they can't move. So, you know, they could get bed sores. They can uh, be laying on their arm and not realize it, just like similar to stroke patient. Um, but they can still have some injuries, potential injury to their body. Potential complications related to immobility. That would be pneumonia and bed sores again. Loss of bowel control, urine and stool. Difficulty voiding. The patient might have a catheter. You always keep an eye on the color of their urine. Is it clear? Is it cloudy? Is it dark? Potential for infection. 
uh, pulmonary and urinary infections we want to keep an eye on and um, that's the color of their urine listen to their lung sounds elevated body temperature so we want to try to keep the room temperature but I know we don't have much control over that we want to try to keep it around 70 but we can't always do that but we want to prevent hypothermia provide adequate clothing and blankets and promptly change wet clothing and linens because sometimes some noxious stimuli could cause that autonomic dysreflexia so always be aware they're at a very fragile point here impaired the ADLs so we want to help them with feeding dressing grooming toileting and you know what that means that means they're going to have inadequate coping because it's hard to have someone care for you or to ask for help it is even when you're feeling good how many of you don't ask for help when you need it because you feel like you want to do it yourself well that's how these patients feel too so we have to let them do as much as possible for themselves so that they can learn to cope and it's going to be a hard road especially if there's a permanent damage they might have an altered sexual function now that's very hard for a younger man car accidents can cause uh, some problems with this so and that level of um, cord injury can cause some sexual function dysfunction um, also inadequate self-care so they really can't take care of themselves and their normal routine they can't carry out so they're going to need uh, help with that so some essential essential components of the teaching plan would be um, know their level of injury the type and treatments and their purposes breathing exercises so coughing and deep breathing uh, range of motion it, let them do it as much as they can you do as much as you can positioning be sure that they're in alignment management of orthostatic hypotension so when they've been in a bed for a long time and you sit them up be aware of that orthostatic hypotension the drop in blood pressure and the up their heart rate goes up skin care and assessment so be sure that you monitor their skin for any breakdown we don't want another problem on top of another problem uh, recognize signs and symptoms of infection changes in sexual function and resources for information about how to adapt to that and protection of body areas that lack sensation now there is a great great case study on page 436 it's about a spinal cord injury a little short story about Todd and some critical thinking questions I'd like you to do um, I will probably put this as one of your um, assignments but I want you to think about this think about what this patient feels and really try to feel put yourself in that place empathy so rehabilitation um, remember rehabilitation begins at admission and that's very true activities that assist the individual to achieve their highest possible level of self-care and independence um, it's going to take a big team of physicians nurse physical therapist occupational therapist speech therapist dietitian social worker psychologist and counselor the patient and family must be emotionally and physically prepared to make adjustments not only to their family but to their home and remember rehab begins on admission so nursing care of the laminectomy so there's some really good um, description here on in box 24.4 on page 437 so pre-op you want to do a good focused assessment um, you want to do one before 
the patient goes in because you want to know how they are before and then compare it to how they are after the surgery is a good comparison. Um, record their vital signs and neurologic status because we want to see did the surgery help. Determine the patient's understanding of their surgery. And then the assessment, focused assessment, monitor the vital signs, this is after the surgery, their vital signs, their neurologic status, their breath sounds, assess movement, range of motion, hopefully things have improved, INO, bowel sounds, bladder distension, inspect the surgical dressing for bleeding, for drainage, because remember if they've gone to the to the spine, hopefully they haven't disrupted any of the uh, spinal cord or any of the fluid, the CSF. So you want to check the drainage for that CSF ring I talked about in another chapter. So also um, Neurological assessment, vital signs. This is the box 24.4 nursing care after laminectomy. Uh, assess their sensory stimulus. And now, can you feel this? Can you feel this? And go from, let's say you go to the arms. So kind of tap them on the arm, right arm, tap them on the left arm. Can they feel it equally on each side? You can do that on the feet, on the legs. You can do it on the shoulders. And then you're comparing each side like you do with your lung sounds. You just want to be sure that they um, have equal feeling, sensation. Uh, they might need TED hose to prevent a DVT. I call them TED hose and anti embolic stockings. Or they might have the pumping up kind with the circulation, keep the circulation going, coughing and deep breathing every two hours. Listen to their breath sounds, incentive spirometer, uh, ambulate as, as the doctor allows, and always dangle the patient before you get them up. Uh, bowel and bladder function. So here one thing on this box 24.4, I want you to notice, and I have it here on the slide too. If they have difficulty voiding after surgery, monitor for urine output. So if they can't urinate, let's say an hour after surgery, do you think that's a problem? Probably not. Two hours? Probably not. Just monitor them. But if it gets to be 68 out, six to eight hours, and if, or, if the patient's uncomfortable, they might need to be catheterized. You might need to notify the physician. Constipation is a problem, can be a problem. Impaired mobility, a problem because they have pain, don't want to move. Inadequate knowledge. Pre-op teaching is really important so they do have the knowledge of what to anticipate. You know, again, I'm gonna say it, knowledge is powered. If they know what to, what is coming, it's easier to accept it because it's, e it's hard to accept the unknown. But if they anticipate it or have been told it might happen, it's easier when they realize it's happened to them. So knowledge Post-op teaching, pre-op teaching is very important. They might have some restrictions and those need to be discussed with the patient.